So yeah, that's what we're dealing with here. We're gonna see if the frogs turn gay. If not, cool. If they do, then I guess it's just one more thing to deal with on the property. So. Hey, what's up y'all? This is William, the permaculture consultant. And today we're going to be doing another permaculture Q&A. Now this permaculture Q&A is going to be uh, special because it's gonna be all of my own problems that are going on on this property after the overspray on the last crop duster that came through and crop dusted the uh, pasture over there on, on the other side of this fence line here. Now, when I got that footage, he had already made quite a few passes before I even honestly figured out what was happening. His first pass was directly above my head right here. His next pass was directly on this over this property line right here. It's like he was just skirting the tops of the trees right through here. And that's, and this actually right here was where he started spraying. He did one pass, went back, came back through, did another pass directly over the trees. And after that, every succeeding pass after that was all over on that pasture over there. Now, given the time of day that I'm recording, which is golden hour right before sunset. If you don't know, golden hour is an area or a time where the colors pop out the most. If I were to come out here during the middle of the day, then you would notice that this grass is all brown now. What they did was spray some sort of broadleaf killer or something like that, and the majority of the vegetation in this pasture was actually not you know, just strictly grass and a lot of it had died. Now they were particularly stupid about this whole thing because they had cows in that pasture at the time. They didn't move the cows until, well, they moved the cows further west. Uh, I can't even pick it up on camera because it's such a big area, but they moved the cows further west after they had cover cropped or covered crop dusted. I keep wanting to say cover cropped. I wish they would have cover cropped. In fact, there's a business idea right there. Instead of crop dusting, you just go out there and spread a bunch of seed, either pioneer species or clover species, depending on where you are, that'd be a good business. I highly doubt this guy had the state of the art GPS, you know, auto spray feature where like as soon as you hit outside the boundaries, the spray just automatically turns off. I doubt he had any of that. He seemed just like a good old boy that was coming out here, crop dusting. Um, and was just lazy about his property lines or flat out didn't see the property line. All that just to say, this episode is going to be dedicated and fixing the, or doing the remediation needed after being hit with, um, you know, all that broadleaf killer and stuff like that. Before we do that, if you need any of your own permaculture Q&A questions answered, then leave them down below in the comments with the hashtag permaculture Q&A at the beginning of the video. If you need consultations, then hit me up down below. Uh, everybody that was at the homesteaders meetup earlier this morning. Thank you guys so much for showing up. You guys are awesome and uh, hope to see you guys at the next one and anybody who didn't make it hope to see you guys at the next one. I'll keep you guys posted and everything. So just stay tuned. There's also an email newsletter. If you want to get emails about when the next meetups are happening, just sign up for that down below. Let's get into the video. So honestly, one of my main immediate concerns, and this is about as close as I'm going to get were these two beehives right here. So the taller one, the one that's closest to us right here, I got both of these guys for free, but the only one that was full was the one that's closest to us right here. The other one on the other side, um, it was completely empty, but the one that's closest to us ended up swarming and then inhabiting the one next to it. So that was handy. I didn't even have to get my hands dirty or anything like that. They just automatically, some of them left. They actually went over to one of these trees, that mimosa that's bending down right at the tip of my finger. Um, they went over to that, it laid it almost to the ground, and then later on just moved into that second nesting box over there. My main concern was that those guys were just gonna leave, um, especially with that, just the amount of spray that occurred that day was pretty intense, and the predominant wind is coming from the west on this property, so it's blowing off of that property, and then all the way, I mean, you could smell that, that broadleaf killer all the way down the road until it makes a turn. All the neighbors could smell it. Tell you what, some of the some of the neighbors, <laughs> some of the neighbors were wondering how many points they'd get if they shot it out of the sky. I'm not going to tell you which neighbors it was, but uh, they also have four wheelers. <laughs> so <laughs> my main concern at first were the bees. They didn't leave or anything like that, so that's good. I will keep an eye on them to see if there is any, if there are any issues in the future. Let's move on to the next step or the next level of concern. 
on the property. And something that I can immediately start monitoring as well. So one of the cool things about having the storage container here is that I can get on top of it every once in a while and get a pretty good vantage point of the property because there is no real elevation out here. This is my best shot at actually getting an overview. Right there, I have black locust seed pods. All of those guys, I'll be selling those in the fall. Those mimosas right there are in bloom, as you can see. They're pretty pretty right now. Uh, I have apples right there. Those are all growing right now. And that's all within sight of this little storage container right here, which is handy because there's one swale right there and I can see the other swale following along right there. And then there's another swale uphill from that as well. But what I'm doing up here is making sure that there isn't any excess or brown spots or like death or anything like that because it was a broadleaf killer. And he did spray directly over the top of this strip right through here. Now I'm not too concerned about the very, very back of the property because I know back there there's a thick, thick tree canopy that caught probably most of that spray and very little probably hit the ground. Now there are going to be concerns. Now right now it hasn't rained since he did that application. There are going to be concerns in the future um, about the runoff from all this rain or from all this spray. Like right now everything is kind of it's still where it was left basically like wherever it landed it's probably off gas a little bit since then and it's still probably in the same location and stuff right now i don't seem to have any death now i did go ahead and get started on clearing down knocking down a lot of this new growth through here you can see the difference between this side of the chicken tractor and the other side of the chicken tractor over there i did go ahead and get started on that the reason being is that i want to go ahead and get that nitrogen or that nutrient cycling started i want to go ahead and get the composting process started on this ground. It's been raining forever. There's enough moisture on the ground. Now, if I chop and drop, basically put some food down on the ground, retain that moisture and also feed the organisms, um, I can go ahead and start locking up any excess toxins. Now, the next concern that I have is the amount of runoff that's going to come off that field and into my pond that's down over there. That pond right now, well, let's just go on down there. But the spray right now doesn't seem to be affecting a whole lot. There is a lot of death in the pasture right now, but also that application rate over there was quite a bit higher. Um, and it's been severely overgrazed. There isn't any tree cover over there, so the leaves didn't really catch anything. Now, while we're working our way down to the pond over here, uh, some people were concerned about whether or not it would actually wash off. Now, a lot of this stuff, this initial spray will actually wash off a lot of the vegetation and stuff. Some of it won't, but a lot of it will. So you can get, remove a lot of it just by washing it and making sure it's nice and clean and stuff. The way to wash it and make sure all of the surface uh, broadleaf killer and stuff like that is removed is by using chlorine dioxide. You can find it down below. I'll leave a link down below talking about it. This company also sells chlorine dioxide and they also give you like the dilutions and stuff that you should use uh, for a proper application and stuff. Uh, the link that I'll leave down below is how to use it for a drench on bananas and stuff. This will apply. There's also, keep in mind, there are also things that they can't claim that this chlorine dioxide does. If they make certain claims about this stuff, then, and they sell it, then they can go to jail. So you're gonna have to read between the lines on this one. Maybe use uh, other sources of information about chlorine dioxide. Just keep that in mind whenever you're looking up chlorine dioxide. Uh, check out the link down below. There's a lot that they can't say, but it's a very, very powerful substance. Now, this pond right here, this pond catches like a large majority of the runoff that comes through that pasture over there. So I need to be thinking, if you're in the similar situation, you need to be thinking, how do I clean or filter that water before it gets to my pond? Or am I gonna treat this pond as a cleaning or filtration system before it spills into another pond? And now I do plan on putting a pond on the downhill side of that dam right there, but that's not until later. And that's not until the ground dries up a little bit. So over here, you can see all of this growth. All of this is in the way of the water actually making it to this property. Keeping all of this plant growth, all this vegetation, all the roots, all the life, all the soil life as well, keeping all of that in the way of actually being stored in this pond is going to help filter it out quite a bit. Now, is it gonna be 100% effective and get all of the toxins? Absolutely not. In my particular case, I pump the water out of this pond right here 
into my little water tower that I have over in the garden right now. I could treat the water afterwards with, again, chlorine dioxide and then use it directly in the garden if I wanted to. I don't know exactly what it does to the soil microbe, but I am curious to find out. But yeah, I could treat the water after pumping it out of the pond. Um, another thing I could do is pile up some really, really good compost in the way of the water uh, or make funnel the water into some sort of uh, bag filtration where I keep compost and stuff like that. Uh, part of the issue is going to be the amount of rain that we get all at once. That's going to be a lot to handle all at once. So yeah, I could have my um, water, I'll go through a biological filter, either at the beginning of the pond, after pumping from the pond to the tanks, these tanks right here, or after pumping out of the tanks onto the garden. Somewhere along those lines, I need some sort of biological filter to lock up toxins, especially if they're planning on doing this year after year. Now, last time I had ever talked to the guy was quite some time ago, and it didn't seem like they were doing any kind of crap like that. So I i don't know if he had a, I know he's changed farm managers since then. So I'll have to, and that guy, I did meet him once and he doesn't speak or speak English. So <laughs> double jeopardy there. I'm not gonna be able to contact him very well, um, but I will figure something out. I know a lot of people were saying take legal action. I'm just not gonna go that route. Um, the amount of time, effort, and money it would take to actually get any kind of justice out of that is not going to be worth it. Instead, I would rather be in a similar situation as a lot of you guys are where you know you're getting chemical overspray from your neighbor's property and stuff and then show you guys the solutions or ways to mitigate that now another benefit is that i'm not selling organic produce off of this property in fact i'm not selling any sort of produce or meat or anything like that off the property that's not the intent of this property like i said before the intent of this property is to turn it into a homesteading school so you guys can come out check it out learn um, we will obviously obviously be shutting down the property in the future spray dates if they do plan on spraying but yeah so y'all oh here some awesome figs here on this tree right here i don't know if you guys can see those yep there's one right there they smell awesome they don't smell like broadleaf killer so that's good so yeah that's what we're dealing with here we're gonna see if the frogs turn gay if not cool if they do then I guess it's just one more thing to deal with on the property. So thank you guys so much for watching. Um, if you guys have any permaculture Q&A, leave them down below. I will keep you guys posted if there is any like plant death on the property or if there's any developments as far as more spraying or anything like that, I'll keep you guys posted. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Until next time, we'll see you.